a it's your last chance our last chance opportunity before you know with all the vo volatility going up and down doesn't matter of bitcoin um it's already reached all, nearly fifty thousand dollars in euro terms that would be as of february 14th 2021 it's around 4 p.m central european standard time it's around 41 so the all-time high would be around forty-one thousand euro and in dollar that would be fifty thousand. so yeah we're going to see incrementally more and more uh ten thousand dollar or ten thousand euro candles in between jumps price jumps so without further ado first of all first of all welcome to the show to the kevin davani connection show I just changed my branding. Otherwise, it's all the same. It's all about, you know, the focus, the root solution is Bitcoin, but I'm going to cover a broad range, you know, a spectrum of topics uh, within and around Bitcoin. It all leads to Bitcoin as a facilitator, as a transformational key, as an evolutionary key. So, yeah, so there are two articles that I really want, would love to read uh, for you and maybe, you know, put up some questions for all of us and some comments, and then we, I, can, we can just wrap it up. So these two articles uh, are, uh, the first one is by, uh, it's called the Bitcoin black hole effect. Bitcoin's effect in an increasingly inflationary environment and the factors accelerating this and it uh, it is authored by William Clemente the third, partially edited by Preston Pish, and was published on February thirteenth, two thousand twenty-one, on bitrar.com, which I'm going to put in the show notes. So this is the article. Uh, the first article I'm going to read: the Bitcoin black hole effect, Bitcoin's effect in an increasingly inflationary environment, and the factors accelerating this. Our savings accounts can be thought of as a sum value of the energy output of our life's work. Inflation is a hidden tax on the common people and is something you need to understand and be positioned accordingly as both an investor, citizen, moving into the near future. Imagine the value of your life's work cutting in half every 15 hours at no fault of your own. This is what happened during the worst case of high inflation ever in Hungary, 1946. Of course, my comment would be Weimar Republic, you know, in the, uh, whenever that was, uh, 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 in the early 20th century. Given the unprecedented levels of money printed that have occurred in the United States since March of last year, why haven't we experienced a dramatic rise in the prices of everyday goods and services around us? How is Bitcoin solution to this problem? What factors could accelerate this process? This article will answer these questions in verbatim that is easy to digest. And you can see, you know, a beautiful image of a, you know, a, a beautiful black uh, hole that's sucking everything inside like a spiral, you know, like a plasmatic spiral. What is hyperinflation? In layman's terms, inflation can be defined as a greater amount of money for the same number of goods and services. However, hype inflation can be defined as inflation occurring at a rate, at a rate greater than 50% a month. This means that by holding your wealth in a hype inflating currency, the number of goods and services you are able to buy at the end of every month cuts in half. The only way to maintain purchasing power in this environment would be to own a scarce asset that is appreciating relative to that currency. As history has shown, this phenomenon is crippling to a nation's economy. As many participants are able to buy fewer goods and services, thus shrinking economic output. And you can see you know, an old image from the early uh, 20th century, that is 1923 Germany, in German children playing with cash during inflation. This shrinking in output causes businesses to cut back costs and ultimately a decrease in employment levels. A decrease in jobs leaves a surplus of demand for the available supply of jobs, meaning wages are bid down to the lowest taker and many are left out of work. 
This is contrary to the current environment of growth we've become accustomed to, where growth funded by debt leads to increasingly more jobs. This increase leads to a surplus of jobs for the number of skilled laborers seeking them, thus causing wages to rise over time. We have established now hype inflation would be detrimental to you, but why haven't we experienced it yet since March 2020 after historic levels of money supply expansion through quantitative easing liquidity inserted into the fixed income market? To understand this, we must understand how we got to this point. Monetary policy backdrop. Following the 2008 debt crisis that brought the global economy to the verge of a deflationary depression, liquidity was inserted into the system to offset the destruction of value caused by the crisis. Since then, this liquidity insertion, mainly taking place through quantitative easing, has been the main tool used to keep the economy afloat, along with the lowering of interest rates. By inserting liquidity through the bond market, the Fed is able to artificially inflate asset prices and other nominally measured values, given the illusion of real growth. By lowering interest rates, the Fed essentially gives businesses a larger profit margin, which appears as economic growth, but in reality is just the decrease of interest rates. These two tools, QE, interest rate lowering, have been used alongside each other to artificially stimulate economic growth. That was until after the March 2020 liquidity event that forced the Fed to lower rates drastically, coming close to 0%, thus leaving them no wiggle room to use interest rate lowering as an effective method of stimulation moving forward. And you can see a chart, federal interest rates dropped dramatically after COVID hit in an effort to offset the slowing economic growth. With businesses having to shut down due to the pandemic, so-called pandemic, revenues were unexpectedly dropped to historically low levels for many industries. This loss of revenues made it nearly impossible for some businesses to pay off the debts, especially given how little savings many businesses are incentivized to have. Rather, these businesses are incentivized by a inflationary monetary policy to continually reinvest revenues into further growth instead of saving, which would lose spending power sitting idle. You can see another chart, debt levels soared soared dramatically in 2020 following COVID-19 shutdowns. This loss of revenues created a shortage of dollars and put pressure on the Fed to provide stimulus relief. In addition to this, countries around the world flocked to dollars and treasuries as a safe ha haven during this time of panic. This massive demand for dollars needed to be offset by massive levels of stimulative liquidity insertion as well. With this massive demand for dollars and interest rates at 0.25% from 0%, the Fed had no choice but to insert historic amounts of liquidity into the system to offset this deflationary pressure. In the chart below, you can clearly see the uptick in the value of the US dollar in March, thus vindicating strong deflation. This is followed by steady decrease in value up to today, as the Fed continues to insert more liquidity, inflating the dollar back to some extent of so-called equilibrium. This insertion of liquidity weakens the dollar's value while increasing the value of assets measured in dollars. So it's asset inflation. Now there's this chart, the DXY, a measurement of the US dollar's value, see an uptick in March 2020, followed by steady devaluation after inflationary forces from increased liquidity. The answer is a lot. Over the last 12 months alone, the Federal Reserve balance sheet grew from $4 trillion to $6 trillion or over 41% of the entire supply of dollars that have ever existed. The new $1.9 trillion stimulus plan 
proposed is greater than all the money printing in 2020 combined. This can be visualized below. Now, I must, might have missed uh, the question previous, how much liquidity did it take to cause inflationary forces to outweigh the deflationary? So there's this graph then um, below, see a dramatic uptick in the Federal Reserve's balance sheet in 2020, likely just the beginning of what's to come. This is the simple reason why we have seen all-time highs in the stock market since March 2020 and a massive rally in housing prices. Liquidity insertion is the only rational explanation for the rallies seen recently in almost every asset as they defied all logic for markets to have recovered so drastically during times of unprecedented debt levels and uncertainty for the economy. During deflation, the value of the dollar increases as the value of assets decreases. During inflation, the value of the dollar increases as the value of assets increases. The indescribable amounts of liquidity cause asset prices to rise by default given the definition of inflation is more dollars for the same amount of goods. And there you can see a clear graphic again, massive increase in M2 money supply since March 2020. I mean, it goes almost vertically up. This increase in asset prices is the main reason we have yet to see broader inflationary effects to tr traditional indexes such as CPI, consumer price index, which is totally, you know, not only fraudulent, but deceptive, you know, and nearly criminal. But, you know, it's at the total lie, the consumer price index. Rather than trickling down into the broad economy, money is being stuffed into assets. This can be illustrated by the velocity of money. The velocity of money is a measurement of how often money is changing hands. In the chart below, you can clearly see as the expansion of the Fed's balance sheet increases, the velocity of M2 money stock is accelerating downwards. You can see that like vertically going down in the year 2020. This phenomenon has massive societal implications. It means the wealth gap is increasing as the new created money is put in the hands of the wealthy and stuffed into assets, never trickling down. So no wonder we have such social upheavals, chaotic conditions, panic, and, you know, I mean, uh, sort of, you know, total up upheaval and, and, and economy wrecked and people suffering in hundreds of millions, if not even billions. At the same time, the average person with a savings account is getting their spending power diluted. This shows the paradox and hypocrisy of the Fed acting as, it, as if money printing benefits the people, but in fact has the complete opposite effect. Many of the social issues we have seen unfold in recent years can at least partially be accredited to decades of inflationary monetary policy causing greater wealth concentration. However, eventually, the newly created money will likely move into the broader economy over time as wealthy people sell assets to purchase goods and services. After all, assets are ultimately brought, not ultimately bought, not for the ownership of the, for, of the asset itself, but for the hope of being able to buy more goods with the appreciation in the value of those assets. In addition to the QE that is being stuffed into asset market capitalizations, we have seen some UBI, universal basic income as well. This is the direct insertion of liquidity into the hands of the people. However, we have likely not seen the effects of this either as the uncertainty of the pandemic has incentivized austerity, not to mention li the limitations of goods and services to currently buy. No travel, no dining, movies, shopping, etc. Once the uncertainty from the pandemic passes, we're likely to see the full effects of the money supply expansion as people begin to buy more goods and services. Now that we've established how high levels of inflation have a high likelihood of taking place, let's take a look at the solution, Bitcoin. Bitcoin's unique properties. Traditionally, the scarce asset of choice investors flock to during inflationary environments has been gold. That is, until Bitcoin was founded in 2009 as a 10x improvement on the properties that make gold an attractive asset to hold. 
being a programmatic protocol existing through the internet, the amount of Bitcoin supply can be audited at any time by anyone. 18,600,200 at a time of the writing, this makes it absolutely scarce. There will only ever be 21 million Bitcoins in existence with the final coin being mined sometime around the year 2140. Another key aspect of Bitcoin that differentiates it from any other asset is its four-year halving cycles. For simplicity purposes, we can describe this as the rate of supply of new Bitcoins being created is cut in half every four years. When these halvings occur, demand can stay the same, but price will go up by default. And you can see that, you know, this, this really predictable uh, 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 curvature and line, you know, uh, the Bitcoin monetary inflation. And we are here, as you can see. This initial impulse is what gives each Bitcoin price run-up momentum. This occurred in 2012, 2016, and most recently May 2020. The chart below illustrates the supply of Bitcoin, blue line here, against the rate of new supply of coins, which diminishes over time, orange line, you know, which goes step by step downwards and downwards. This diminishing supply can be put into perspective by considering the following. There are 18.5 million coins after 12 years of existence, approximately, but the final coin will take nearly 40 years to be introduced into supply. This means you're measuring something becoming exponentially scarcer, Bitcoin, in something that is becoming exponentially less scarce, US dollars and fiat money in general. Three factors accelerating Bitcoin's black hole effect. This effect is accelerated by several phenomena I think are worth understanding. Speculative attack on US dollars made popular by Pierre Rochard, the thesis of a new risk-free rate derived from Bitcoin, and the concept of lending over collateralization that is an effect of seeking out this risk-free trade, both conceptualized, made popular by Preston Pish. Pierre, Rochard, Pierre Rochard's speculative attack. Speculative attack is the idea of leveraging the collapsing US dollar to acquire more Bitcoin early in the transition to this new system based on the Bitcoin monetary network. As Bitcoin appreciates in US dollar value, it makes the dollar denominated loan taken out to buy the coins easily payable. This visual created by Crucis underscore BTC illustrates this well. And you can see, you know, uh, this beautiful graphic purchasing power against time. And uh, again, you know, a second one, the first one, it says borrow dollars to buy Bitcoin. And uh, you just need to check out the graph for itself. And the other one, sell portion of Bitcoin to repay debt. This concept has already happened in the case of Michael Saylor's MicroStrategy finalized on December 12th, 2020. MicroStrategy issued $650 million of convertible debt notes at 0.75% annual interest rate using the capital to acquire more Bitcoin. Saylor effectively leveraged the depreciating US dollar to stack more coins on his balance sheet, which are appreciating. In my humble opinion, I see this as a genius move and one that others were likely copy in the coming months. If the US dollar really was to reach an uncontrollable level of inflation, a last move by the Fed may be to do this same trade on a federal level by printing dollars to acquire Bitcoins to stack on the balance sheet. Only time will tell. Preston Pish yield spread over collateralization thesis. Recently, Preston Pish has said that he's starting to think hyperbitcoinization might be less qualitative and more quantitative. In remarks he made early in the year, he often suggested that the breakdown in fiat would occur from an erosion of trust. This trust didn't have a numeric value, which makes it difficult to determine when such an event could occur. But based on his more recent comments, maybe it is becoming more quantitative. For example, 
During a recent show with Peter McCormick, he talked about institutional investors and retail investors alike being able to capture near risk-free returns in the Bitcoin derivatives market. Since Bitcoin is a very volatile asset, buying the underlying and selling longer dated futures simultaneously provides substantial returns, especially when compared to any other financial market that's traded with this much liquidity. As an example of this, I'd like to reference a recent tweet from data analyst Willy Wu. And it says in this tweet, plan B quoted in a conversation we had. But right now, looking at my trade screen, 46,461 June futures contract, 42,873 Bitcoin price. Buy Bitcoin, sell futures, unmarket neutral. I pocket $3,588 in yield, holding those positions to June expiry. That's 8.4% return over 4.5 months. Now, I, K. Van Devani, I always say, you know, just do your own due diligence, really good due diligence. You got to know what you're doing, you know, the risk reward ratio. And, uh, you know, you need to do really have a, a really good comprehension of, or, you know, whether you really want to give up your, your Bitcoin or lock it up or whatever, really, it's, whether it's worth it. And so these are the questions that a lot of other, uh, you know, experts, I would say Bitcoiners are asking, you know, is, is this really, uh, or should we wait for 40 to 50% at least, you know, uh, interest rate to make these kind of similar uh, trades? Anyway, further on. Uh, this article. Unlike traditional debt markets, much of lending in the crypto economy is done with over collateralization or Bitcoin economy, I should say more precise. For example, if a person wanted to borrow one Bitcoin today, then they might need to deposit two Bitcoin worth of value while also paying 9.75% annual interest rate. The over collateralization process is in effect causing more and more Bitcoin to be locked into escrow while also protecting the Bitcoin lenders from default because the Bitcoin markets trade 24 hours a day and 365 days a year. Now, it's important to highlight that not all lending borrowing platforms are requiring over collateralization today, particularly for institutional borrowers, but many suspect as prices become even more volatile moving forward, depositors will demand such over collateralization to protect their funds. Unlike the traditional fractional reserve system that most market participants are accustomed to, the crypto economy is dramatically different. The shift to over collateralize is how risk is reduced between borrowers and lenders. So if a person has a meaningful amount of Bitcoin, they can now borrow against that Bitcoin to conduct the risk-free trades described above in the futures market to keep additional adding to keep adding additional yield to the portfolio. This appears to be providing an incentive structure to make Bitcoin even more scarce and sought after as so-called perfect collateral with no counterparty risk and near immediate liquidity. In fact, this can actually be seen by current lending rates. Today, if a person were to deposit USDC into a lending platform, the interest being paid is double that of Bitcoin. This is a crazy thought for, for people in the traditional finance world that view the risk, the so-called risk of Bitcoin to be indescribably higher than fiat currencies. But here it is. On every lending platform around the world and in the free and open crypto market, lending rates for fiat that's 9.6% are higher than Bitcoin, 4.5%. An additional consideration when thinking about the implications of this long, short, near risk free investment strategy is that it becomes more lucrative as volatility and prices become more dramatic. All right, um, let me just stop here. This means more and more Bitcoin will be locked into escrow as the trade becomes more popular. Not only are traders implementing the strategy locking up the Bitcoins until the duration of the contract is complete for European style contracts, but for physically settled exchanges. The escrow to write the contract is 100% collateralized on many exchanges. So if the spreads provide greater returns for longer duration contracts, 
those Bitcoin are locked up for even longer terms. Now, if this dynamic were true, we should see the open interest for such derivatives grow over time. And here's the chart. And you see a chart with the title aggregated open interest of Bitcoin futures. Given that coins are already being removed from the available supply of exchanges at a record pace, this concept described at Precious and Prish will accelerate the supply suffocation already occurring. The, the chart below illustrates the rate at which coins are already being withdrawn from exchanges, therefore not available to be bought. And here you see, uh, you know, uh, Bitcoin balance and exchanges graphics, and uh, with the note, notice the rate at which coins are being withdrawn is only accelerating downwards, almost inversely to price. Not only that, but the rate appears to be much faster than previous four-year halving cycles. It's hard to say definitely what's driving this behavior, but it could be attributed to the characteristics of the derivatives market that's being discussed above. Now next to the Bitcoin's black hole effect on asset prices. Another important point that Pish discussed during the What Bitcoin Did podcast was this idea that lending rates will go higher. He suggested that as the price and volatility grows in magnitude, it could drive an influx of borrowing interest rates while also reducing Bitcoin deposits, thus driving the free and open interest rates in these markets higher. In fact, it could potentially set up a light bulb moment for traditional fixed income investors as they view the disparity between uh, negative interest rates, uh, uh, percentage, I think, lending rates, N NIRP lending rates, and double-digit free and open crypto rates. This concern only becomes more likely as Bitcoin breaches a trillion in market cap and is taken more seriously by global banks, payment processes, and institutions alike. If such a scenario would play out, one cannot help imagining the result it could have on discount rates, capitalization rates for equities, especially in a world where everyone seems to believe inflation doesn't exist and rates continue to go negative. Pish used an example on the show where he suggested that if the market started to agree with USDC lending rates at 10%, that means equity price earnings ratios would need to be priced at 10 or lower to attract Bitcoiners out of the position and into stocks. As we know, current market premiums are priced at 30 to 35 times earnings today. So if such a scenario were to occur, it would reprice stocks at two thirds the price of today in Bitcoin terms. Finally, let's not forget about the $120 trillion traditional fixed income market. What would it mean for that? Well, if the entire market is denominated in an eroding currency, that the rest of the business world stops using to conduct economic calculation, I suspect it results in intense impairment for the owners of such financial instruments. This article was authored and edited also partial by, uh, 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 by Preston Pish, but it was authored by William Clemente III. He is a sophomore finance major at East Carolina University, advocate for making economics easy to grasp, macroeconomics, financial markets, and Bitcoin. So I found it very interesting whether uh, this all plays out as he describes. I don't know, and I'm not, you know, a macro analyst, and I'm definitely not, uh, you know, a, a financial, you know, expert uh, such as Preston Pisham or William Clemente. But it just shows uh, that it's not a question of uh, if, but when and how fast and how accelerated, how exponentially accelerated by order of magnitude. So check it out on bitraw.com slash the Bitcoin black hole effect, which I'm going to put in the show notes. So this is, uh, I would say, not even the, you know, the totality of, of this whole process taking place into the, you know, into the hyper Bitcoinization process. But I think it will soon, you know, this, this Parker Lewis uh, terminology, gradual and suddenly, maybe it's actually great, gradual, slowly, gradually, and then all of a sudden exponential by order of magnitude process. But, you know, there's so many factors, so many conditions playing at the same time simultaneously that, uh, and with all the demand and the, and the supply shocks and the institutionals coming in now with not only millions and billions, but now soon with, with trillions, the uh, career risk. 
risk you know are is taking off the fiduciary duties actually coming in not only of you know diverse institutions but soon pretty soon now with pension funds coming in so I think it's a really interplay, a beautiful interplay, a beautiful, uh, you know, sort of a natural emerging uh, uh, self-coordinated cosmic, um, uh, you know, a play uh, that's taking place. Um, and uh, it just, you know, it's, it's, it's actually, you know, this natural emerging money uh, with this as, as hard as and scarce as money, uh, you know, from, 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 uh, you know, starting as a, as a, as a, as a collectible, then a store of value, medium exchange, uh, uh, unit of account, eventually, you know, a total global, inter global uh, settlement layer. And on top of that, you know, the, uh, what, what also William Clemente or others are, are describing or have been describing this, this second and third layer playing, playing out or as a medium exchange now with Jack Muller's strike. So all these things, you know, and then countries uh, trying to escape this, this hyperinflation sanctions, embargoes, such as Iran starting mining and, and, and you know, paying directly to the miners. And putting into reserve assets such as MicroStrategy and now other, you know, Elon Musk, Teslas, uh, which is still, you know, a very tiny drop on a hot stone. It's like 1.5 billion. It's like nothing, you know, compared to the to the hundreds of billions or trillions of dollars that are that are, that are you know the total addressable market. So we're going to be, you know, I mean, seeing huge surprises, huge shocks of people, these no coiners and naysayers, also Nassim Taleb with this stupid, you know, arrogant, you know, full of vanity bullshit. I mean, he's totally contradicting himself. All the books he's actually written is just, you know, diarying and, and just, you know, uh, just shitting on his own books actually, because he hasn't, he hasn't actually read the Bitcoin standard, even though of, of Safid and the Moose, even though he wrote the foreword to that. And uh, so he seems not even to understood or comprehended anything that he has read or written himself, or maybe even, you know, studied, maybe even did he even study the Austrian principles of Austrian economics, Mises, Hayek, or whatever. I mean, it's so ridiculous. It's so fucking ridiculous. He's just making a clown of himself. He's just losing his dignity and insulting his own diligence uh, and, and intelligence, I mean. So let's go to the next article. Anyway, stop with my rant. Um, so that's Stephen Barber. You know, uh, he's the CEO of Upstream Data. And uh, yeah, and mining uh, beautiful, you know, companies, beautiful concept. So he's actually mining with uh, naturally flared vented gas. And it just, you know, before it goes all, all the methane that is actually environmental polluting, instead of, you know, just, just being wasted, he, he's just, you know, giving, you know, having clients that have, is sitting on a lot of not only oil, but, but flared and vented or otherwise wasted gas. And they say, you know what, why don't you just use it, you know, and it's much more efficient, not only, uh, as a side effect, uh, not only protecting the environment and, and cleaning the air, but uh, but you are actually uh, you know bit mining Bitcoin. That's it's amazing. Anyway, inflection point. The inflection point. It was uh, uh, when was it? Uh, it was published on February thirteenth, two thousand twenty-one, and it's called the inflection point soon. Fiat money dies. I can, I could, I can, I couldn't agree more than that. And it's uh, you can find the article on sgbarber.medium.com slash the meat inflection point, which I'm going to put in show notes. So the subtitle is uh, "Soon Fiat Money Dies," and it starts off like this: The Bitcoin price continues to soar, and its steady exponential ascent upwards will soon approach a critical point of no return. This is the inflection point. And there's this description uh, or the definition of inflection point. What does it mean? Probably out of Wikipedia or something or dictionary. First of all, mathematics, a point of a curve at which a change in the direction of curvature occurs. Secondly, in US, in business, a time of significant change in, in a situation, a turning point. I would also call it a tipping point. And you can see a graph, you know, with a tangent, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, the inflection point is a point in time where the momentum encapsulated by the adoption of Bitcoin is so great that confidence in fiat money, particularly in, in the world's 
premier reserve fiat money, the US dollar, is shaken beyond recovery. USD hype inflation begins in earnest in fiat currency, as we currently know, it is set aside by the state, undesired by the populace. The state is forced to accept losses and to start offering a more competitive version of fiat. Please take note that I define the state a little differently than the common definition. Let's explore with an arbitrary scenario. And you can see a graph, Bitcoin price, and the inflection point, you know, pretty much like an S-curve. In the price scenario shown, the USD BTC price first experiences a decaying exponential rise, the present phase shown in blue, followed by a transitional and tangential phase in which the exponential curve inflects and begins to accelerate, shown in green. With the hype inflation of the US dollar, this phase continues until Bitcoin is worth infinite US dollars and the complete destruction and capitalization of fiat money is complete. Here I show that happening around the year 2040, though the timing and price are not what really matters, rather the shape of the curve. Is this curve likely? Will there be an inflection point? I think there's no other rational alternative. Fiat money is inherently unstable and is actually a relatively new experiment with it being introduced in its current form after the Bretton Woods system was terminated in 1971 a mere 50 years ago. Quote, on August 15, 1971, the United States unilaterally terminated convertibility of the US dollar to gold, effectively bringing the Bretton Woods system to an end and rendering the dollar a fiat currency. At the same time, many fixed currencies, such as the pound sterling, also became free floating. Unquote. A lot of bad shit has happened since 1971, the Nixon shock, as you remember or not. In fact, to claim that fiat money is unstable is a gross understatement. With talk of negative interest rates looming, fiat money is well on its way to a spectacular self-implosion. Central banks, the distributors of fiat, having to compete with an alternative form of money is practically unprecedented. So a sound alternative money like Bitcoin is going to be a significant accelerant in fiat money's existing crash course. Bitcoin simply offers a highly accessible exit door from central banking monopoly money and its meteorotic price appreciation presents people with little reason to hoard fiat. And you can see a picture of a Bitcoin store, a Wall Street ple bets pleb recently wrecked by by his GME gamble is seen here conjuring the room of requirement. How will we recognize the inflection point? In the early days of Bitcoin's price discovery, the bull or bear price cycles were quite frequent. New all-time highs were followed by large more than 50% corrections occurring within a matter of weeks and months. These cycles have since appeared to have lengthened into the years Though it is quite early yet to tell for sure if this is the actual trend or just variability. Before Bitcoin even had a price, it was still valued by the earliest users. One could argue that during the period of January 3rd, 2009 till late 2010, when there was no listed price, the cycles could have been extremely short and frequent. I certainly don't know how long the cycles will extend and then contract. If they do at all, I just hypothesize the general trend below. And you can see again, the same uh, you know, uh, graph as in the beginning, the inflection point is characterized by on particularly long bull cycle point, bull cycle. Note that this inflection point concept and cycle ID is, incompat is incompatible with the populist stock to flow model, which is based on a consistent four-year pump cycle as scheduled by each halving every 200,000, 210,000 blocks or four years. If, if the inflection point concept holds, then there will be a time during the tangential transition from pre-inflection point to post-inflection point that the cycle durations will begin speeding up again. Well, after the inflection point, Fiat inflates at accelerating rates until it becomes essentially worthless and unusable. Sort of like how the Venezuel Venezuelan Bolivar is acting today. The BTC USD price must inevitably strike a vertical asymptote 
not shown, like a clown car hurtling into a brick wall. The timing of this will probably be somewhat dictated by the state with their own, with their introduction of a transitional, more competitive sounder fiat, as I described below. It could be instantaneous as people are required to redeem the existing fiat for the newly introduced fiat improvement, so-called improvement. The central bank a clown car collides with a brick wall called Bitcoin, as you can see in this image. If the inflection curve, as I described, or anything similar plays out, then I do not think we will be able to recognize it until some point in time well after the inflection point has been passed, though it will become clear in hindsight if it does occur. What happens after the inflection point? Personally, I believe that fiat hyperinflation is inevitable and that the state will soon be forced to issue a more competitive currency and transition today's unreserved fiat back to a fractional or even fully reserved money. Most likely, the reserve will be something that already control, they already control with a long history, such as convertible notes redeemable for precious metals like gold or silver. And you can see the picture of the, another clown and gold bug and ignorant, you know, stupid old, uh, you know, uh, ignorant and stubborn man. But, you know, I guess, you know, he's got a different skin in the game than that's Peter Schiff. And it says, listen, Pete deserves a small win. He's one of the good guys. Yo, serious, bro. I think even now our status policymakers can see the writing on the wall and can feel the mountain pressure. The balls are in between the vice of looming negative interest rates and the subsequent risk of mass violent protests and uprising by the working class who are experiencing significant and unsustainable increases to the cost of living. The state exists to create and distribute money. Under no circumstance can they yield that power as doing so willingly would be a highly unnatural and irrational behavior. Sort of like expecting someone to give up the shelter and means to put on the table. Good luck taking it from them willingly. And this is, by the way, a very special ignore topic and question I'm going to discuss with a you know, bunch of other you know, well-known Bitcoiners, such as Giacomo Zucco, Alex Vetsky, Eric Vasquez, maybe even Robert Breedlove in the very near future. You know, sort of Bitcoin or the, even in the hyper Bitcoinized world versus state, nation states, central banks, and the military industrial corporate intelligence complex and what have you. Sort of against the monopoly of, on, uh, on, on uh, aggression, violence, um, uh, coercion, uh, uh, you know, wars, false flag, and uh, destruction. And control, uh, most of all. However, that being said, the state can indeed attempt to save their reproductive organs by conceding something and offering a sounder form of money. Bitcoin will force the state to take losses in order to maintain their ownership and control. This will only be temporary as Bitcoin will continue to be an erosive force against state assets. So considering they already control the majority of the gold supply, we can fully expect to see a gold reserve fiat make a return within one to two decades. I'd guess within 10 years after the inflection point, and I'd even predict this will all occur be before 2040. In the meantime, they will likely attempt to first ban or censor Bitcoin to some degree before they concede anything, and they will certainly apply impractical taxation to Bitcoin users. But that's a topic to be explored in another essay. The post-fiat utopia, a world on sound deflationary money is a beautiful place. I don't think there's any need for me to illustrate how such a sound money utopia may be embodied because Dr. Safed and Amus has already done a wonderful job exploring that idea in his seminal book, The Bitcoin Standard. If you have ever been a Bitcoin holder for any significant period of time, then you're already starting to experience the wealth and health heralded by the sound money utopia. That feeling of looking at your hot phone wallet as it continues to increase in value, even though you routinely spend them from it has never been experienced in living memory. Conclusion, to clue this up, when fiat money finally dies, Bitcoin will have to be priced in something else entirely. Goods and services will be priced in Bitcoin, but Bitcoin itself will be measured by something new altogether. We can predict it will be priced in hashes and or in kilowatt hours, the energy consumed in mining. 
both of which are easily measured. The kilowatts required, the kilowatt hours required to produce a Bitcoin can be compared to the kilowatt hours required to produce any good, including a typical man hour. And you can see a, a hash price graph, total hashes per day divided by total Bitcoin mine per day, you know, X, uh, whatever hashes per Bitcoin going, you know, up and up exponentially. And then it says here below hash price, the amount of hashes required to pr produce one Bitcoin. This is an idea I've been fascinated by for years, and it has some interesting implications, such as improved methodology for calculating the net present value of pollution. This is something I plan to write on in a future essay. I hope you enjoyed this take. Let's keep an eye out for the inflection point. Steve. Beautiful article. I could, you know, uh, I could comment on and on and on uh, for, on this article, but, you know, as it is, uh, as a closed article, I would say it's a beautiful article. It complements uh, with these two articles I read for you, the one with William Clemente and Steve Barber. They complement one another, especially in these unbelievably, unimaginably exciting times. There's going to be a lot of shocked people. Billions of people are going to be shocked how fast, by order of magnitude, how uncensorable, how unstoppable, how unconfiscatable this hardest, scarcest money with the absolute, you know, capped 21 million Bitcoin. And, you know, by the way, 90, 95% or 98% of all Bitcoin will be mined by approximately 2030 or 2035. And, and the remaining whatever, 3 to 5% of, of the totality of Bitcoin until 21 million will be mined until the year 2140. And more and more now, not only institutions, hedge funds, uh, endowments, uh, alternate high individuals, uh, equity, uh, whatever offices, but now, you know, pension funds are going to come in. And, and eventually, you know, <laughs> then nation states or smaller ones, bigger ones, mid-sized ones, whatever. And then eventually the maybe even some smaller exotic central banks. And, and then, you know, as we can see, Turkey, Venezuela, Iran, all these countries, especially where there are human rights violations, the escape out of it, or even on, on a national scale. But eventually, you know, the, the goal, the end goal, the end vision is the separation of money versus state, the making the nation state obsolete, the central banks will just kill itself. They will bleed out of the assholes. And uh, eventually the military industrial intelligence corporate complex, you know, inflicting so much horrendous suffering, pain, destruction, theft, systematic fraud, corruption, theft will finally, you know, find its end and in a peaceful or at least say most frictional, uh, most uh, frictionless, and most peaceful transition into a totally new, you know, ushering into a new evolutionary paradigm shift, a totally new human civilization on every level you can think of, with localized economies, regional economies, with the hardest and scarcest money, with the deflation economies, where not only just goods and service and product, but I mean. Finally, at this juncture of human, human evolution, you know, zero to one technological evolution on every aspect and every aspect and every level and every dimension you can think of starting at energy production, transportation, health, uh, um, uh, you know, all these, all these jobs that can be taken over by robotics, by artificial intelligence, more and more decentralized, you know, that's a totally you know, total di distinction between centralized and decentralized technologies, right? So it depends, you know, who controls it. You know, this is like with Bitcoin. And so we will eventually, I'm, I'm very certain and, and hopeful and faithful in that, that all these technologies, robotics, uh, you know, uh, artificial intelligence, um, uh, all these things, you know, um, will be more and more decentralized. So we won't, we won't be, you know, we won't have to be scared, you know, like, like Elon Musk has, you know, from time to time warned from, uh, uh, you know, of uh, warned um, us from this, you know, about this artificial, in, artificial intelligence, 
Yes, it depends how do you, who's prog programming, how centralized it is. So it's the same. It's the same thing. In my opinion, my humble opinion is the same thing. But we can finally, you know, give people the, the freedom, the time, the prosperity, the abundance, you know, the free time to, to finally dedicate their time, their precious time to do things they, they really love to do passionately out of their heart and ethos and soul, whatever that is, you know, whether it be education, research, technology, you know, uh, educating and inspiring children, whatever that is, or, you know, just going into space, whatever that is, you know, or, or technological innovation, then finally, at least we can, at least on planet Earth, go from A to B or from here to any kind of island, country, continent, whatever, you know, to any kind of territory within seconds and minutes. That is, I'm telling you, already possible. So without going into utopia or anything, but it is already possible. But we need all these compartmentalized, militarized technologies which have been developed and siphoned off with trillions of dollars going into real civilizational, you know, on the hardest and scarcest money rooted, you know, what I'm go, what you, know, you know where I'm getting at, right? So we will even live longer. We, we, I'm, I'm telling you this with all the genetics and health and nutritious and nutritional energy absorption technologies, we can live at least 150, 200, 300 years. We think it's, un we, maybe we can, because we don't understand it. We don't comprehend it. We never had the freedom, the, lu the luxury of really free time and, and independence, you know, and really it's really time to, to free us from this unbelievable horrendous slavery, which is in plain sight. Anyway, my name is Kevin Davani. I'm the host of the Kevin Davani Connection Show. And in totality, it's all about love, peace, ethos, abundance, and human uh, happiness and evolution. So thank you so much again. I want to really thank you for your, for your uh, you know, contributions, for your questions, for your support, for listening. Buy Bitcoin, auto stack, uh, stack sats, take care of your privacy, your security, just stack sats, don't trade, don't, don't sell, just take care of your security, your privacy, put in a hardware wallet, single wallet, multi-sig wallet, there's a bunch of, there are really tons of materials out there, uh, which you can watch, listen to, with it be articles, uh, podcasts, videos, YouTube, um, and yeah, we are really going into a beautiful human evolution with 8 billion people. And, uh, it's really time we wake up not only individually, but as a collective, let's human civilization. So thank you so much for listening to, to the Kevin Davani connection episode, and I'll see you soon again. Bye.